Who's ready for the Word of God today? Here we go. Well, we're still in the book of Ephesians. I was visiting with some of our snowbirds, and, and those of you that are, are uh, heading north for the summer, uh, we will miss you. But I said, I said, you know, we might still be in Ephesians when you get back next fall. So, <laughs> But we, we surely do miss all of you that uh, take off for the summer, and, and we appreciate you being part of the Skyway family. We want you to still be with us online. Okay, we're in our series on the book of Ephesians. This is message number seven, and today's message is entitled, One New Man. One New Man. How many have ever heard the phrase, One New Man? And how many know what one new man is? You're like, all right, you know, somebody knew it out there. We got one out there. And, but we've heard the phrase, and a lot of times we think, well, it has something to do with Jew and Gentile, and it has something to do with Israel. But I believe it goes even bigger than that, because the, the Greek word for man is the word anthropos, and that's where we have anthropology. And so we're talking about the, the mankind. Uh, scientists would call us homo sapiens, that we're all the same race, we're all the same group. How many of you know that? But boy, racism sure hurts, doesn't it? And so today as I go through the book of Ephesians, we're in this uh, chapter, or in this book, uh, line by line, verse by verse, but I have to really just step out and, and look at a verse of scripture from the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, it says this in Acts 17, 26, that he has made all nations of men of one blood to dwell on the face of the earth, ordaining four appointed seasons and boundaries of their dwellings. Let's just look at that scripture for a minute before we jump into Ephesians and talk about one new man. That we all, underneath this skin, we all have the same blood. And, and when... when you look at these topics from a scientific point of view. If you need uh, an organ transplant, that organ could, if, if you're a Native American, that organ could well be coming from somebody of Asian descent. And, and so it really isn't about the color of the skin or the exterior or, or how many wrinkles or how smooth your skin is, but underneath we all have the same blood. That's what the Word of God says. Now, isn't that an interesting statement in Acts 17, 26? It says that, or, that we're all of one blood. Think about that because be, back then they didn't have all the scientific proof that we have today. But the Word of God says we're all of the same blood. That's a powerful, powerful thought. And so we're going we're gonna to tie into that. We're going to look into that. You know, it says that in um, Galatians 3, 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Let's just leave that scripture up there for a moment because we're going to talk about one new man from the, from the book of Ephesians, and I, I'm taking it to a broader context, but in the context of where the phrase one new man was penned by the apostle Paul, the Jews were very exclusive. They did not interact with the rest of the nations of the world, and they were all known as Gentiles. So unless you were, are born a, a Hebrew and, and full Hebrew descent, then you are not a Hebrew, and that puts you in a category called Gentiles. And so that's where most of us fall into. But as Paul was writing, he said, God has always planned to bless all the nations of the world through one man named Abraham. How many have ever heard of a guy named by the name of Abraham? <laughs> Father Abraham had many. All right, anyway, so, so Abraham was a Gentile before he became a Jew. All right? And so that's how Abraham started the whole promise. And, and he was a good Gentile before he crossed over. The word Hebrew means to cross over. And so before he, Abraham the Hebrew, the one who crossed over, and thus the phrase Hebrew comes into existence about Abraham, and then the lineage of Abraham, but always from the very beginning, God promised, said, all the nations of the world are going to get blessed through Abraham. And so he started as a Gentile, he became a Hebrew, and now through Jesus, all people have access to the full blessings of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Does that sound good to you? 
Amen. So whenever in Galatians it said there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's, that's a powerful statement. And I want us to just kind of walk through some of these things together. Because there have been many, there has been conflict existing with mankind starting with the first recorded family. I mean, you know, there was only one family. They didn't have violence on TV. They didn't have violent video games. And not that I'm promoting violence on TV or violent video games, but I'm saying that bad things can come into any family. Hello? The first family, they had homeschooling. Everything was good. Because sometimes we put things on one another. Well, if you were a better parent, your son wouldn't have behaved this way. Now, I know I'm already gone to meddling, and we're just getting into the introduction. But I hope I'm, I'm speaking a word of hope that started with the first family, Cain kills his brother Abel, and there's always been conflict between human beings. And it really hasn't changed. And mankind has known suffering and pain by many different names throughout the ages of time. Mankind has suffered. People have committed great atrocities against one another in the name of personal conflicts, the name of country, and especially in the name of religion. And that's why some believe that, that Christianity or religion is the source of all these conflicts. But what we're going to look at today in the book of Ephesians and from the Holy Scriptures is that God has brought a solution. But we are not to deny that conflict has come even from Christianity in the past. I think one of the most important things we can do to, bring, to move us forward is that we acknowledge the sins that have been committed in the past. And when we acknowledge these things, it, it allows us to bring healing and gives us hope for moving forward versus trying to justify the sins of the past. I think as long as people try to justify the things that have gone on, then it's hard to move forward. It was interesting Wednesday in prayer, and we can just leave that slide up for a moment because it talks about the atrocities. Wednesday in prayer, Henry Groover was with us. How many of you know Brother Henry? Just a great part of the Skyway family. He's been in Japan for the last six months, been in Asia, not just Japan, but Japan, China, Taiwan, some other places. And prayer really went on an interesting, in an interesting direction because he started talking about the Trail of Tears. And that was whenever the Native Americans were forced to go to reservations and the, the way the death that came to the Native Americans and some of the greatest atrocities that have happened have happened right here in this nation. It's, it's a huge landmass. Things that have gone on in America doesn't make us immune uh, to say that whatever has happened is, is that we can justify or something else. But if we look at the history of America, atrocities have happened in America. He went on to talk about how the railroads were built by, by the immigrants from China and the things that transpired there. And I think that if all of us can look into our roots, we just go back two, three generations, most of us can identify with something that's transpired where we've either have our families, our backgrounds have felt the effects of racism or have been part of putting racism on others. And if, if you study the history of, of man, it's usually the group that was last persecuted somehow reaches a level of acceptance. They become the ones that persecute the next group coming in. This is part of the fallen nature of man. And I believe that what we will read today in the scriptures is that Jesus has given us a solution. That the church should be the place that looks like heaven. I love looking out in this congregation today. I have guests that come from all over the world. They say, Greg, I've never seen so many different colors of skin worshiping at the same time on Sunday morning. They say that, you, that Skyway is unique, but I, but I say Skyway should look like heaven. What do you all think? Shouldn't we look more like heaven? Because Jesus came to give all of mankind 
anthropos, male, female, all of our different backgrounds, hope. See, Jesus came, Jesus never came to cause more pain to our fellow man in his name. He came to bring peace, healing, and restoration. He came so that we all can come together as one before God. That's the heart of our Father. And I think that's what's going to be in the roots of this next great awakening, even as we talk about National Day of Prayer. How will we awaken? We need to awaken to healing, restoration, to hope. We need to be open to God doing new things in new ways. Amen? Amen. All right, let's jump into the scriptures. E Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Every nationality which is not Jewish. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. This is Paul's introduction to this concept of one new man, how in Ephesus, which was a huge Gentile community, that those that were Judaizers, they were coming in and saying, you really can't be saved until you convert to Judaism, and then you can convert to Christianity. And so Paul was refuting them, and he was standing against the what would be called the Judaizers, and because they would come in, they would create this big, uh, big storm in the city and get everybody in conflict and get, get the eyes off of the gospel and get people focusing on their physical attributes. Has anything changed? Wherever I go preach in the world, I have leaders draw me aside and say, well, you know, that may work in America. I said, I didn't bring you an American gospel. Uh, I'm bringing, you know, whenever, no matter where the gospel is preached, two, two things happen. Every, every nation has, we're receptive to the gospel, but yet we tend to, by the time I get to the end of this chapter, how many think I'm going to get to the end today? I sure hope so. Because if I don't get there, you'll be like, what's he talking about? So, but, you know, that we're citizens of heaven, See, when I gave my heart to Jesus, when you gave your heart to Jesus, when we gave our hearts to Jesus, we had a brand new passport given to us. We're citizens of heaven. Woo! That'd get me thrown in jail. I wouldn't pull that one going through customs. Well, I'm a citizen of heaven. They'd be like, yeah, you go over here and talk to those guys with the guns. So I just give them my U.S. passport and get through customs quickly. But one of the beautiful things, no matter what country I go into, I love going to countries for the very first time. Just give me a day with the, with the people in that country, the people that are there, and we fall in love with one another because there's a citizenship in heaven that transcends, transcends the borders of nations. There's a citizenship in heaven that's so much higher than the cultures that can contain us. We can appreciate culture. We can respect culture. We can learn from culture. But there's a citizenship that takes us so much higher. And so this is why Paul is introducing this. And for a lot of us who are, who are Gentiles, we read something like this verse of Scripture and say, well, you know, who's circumcised, who's uncircumcised? I don't understand what he's talking about. He's talking about the culture of the Hebrews was introduced with circumcision. But again, Abraham was a Gentile who became a Hebrew. So now they're saying for people that are not Jewish, you have to become Jewish before you can get saved. Now, we have to be careful about imposing culture above faith. Okay, moving right along. Now, in Ephesians 2.12, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That is one depressing verse of scripture. I would not just put that on Facebook all alone, all right? So think about that. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope without God in the world. But somebody say, but Christ. <laughs> Jesus changed all that, everybody. Jesus turned it around. So when the, the Jewish people, they received those promises and, 
and all the messianic promises of the Old Testament, what separates Christianity from all the other isms of the world is that we have prophetic promises. God wrote things out hundreds, sometimes thousands of years before Jesus ever died on the cross. He spoke in writing about what was about to transpire. The Jewish people are the ones that gave us those writings. This little tiny nation, just so small, a speck on the earth, but it always seems to be in the middle of controversy. It always seems to be the group that needs to be exterminated. There's something about this world system that hates the Jews, and is because they have given us the words of promise. And that's why we pray for the peace of God to come to Israel. That's why we stand. Why? Because without the meticulous way they transcribed and wrote these promises, we would never have them. So at that time, when, when Israel was isolated they were containing these promises about God's hope for all the world that he said would come through Abraham. Verse 13, but now, but now, but now, read it out loud with me, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ooh, that's worth just giving God praise. Isn't that great news? We've been brought near through the blood. Remember, we all have the same blood, but there's a certain blood that was shed on a cross 2,000 years ago. There was a very specific blood. It was the blood of Jesus. Never take the blood of Jesus out of your vocabulary. Because it is that precious blood by which we are forgiven of all of our sins. Nobody else will ever have to be sacrificed. There's no animal sacrifices, no human sacrifices. But one time on the cross, a man died, the man Christ Jesus. And when he died on that cross and his blood hit the ground, God said, it's finished. It is finished. And one time for all, he was sacrificed for the sins of all mankind to be forgiven. We have been brought near. That's good news, isn't it? Let's read on together. Ephesians 2.14, Jesus is our source of peace. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Verse 16, and might reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by it, having put to death the enmity. Wow. What Paul is trying to do here is that as the Judaizers would come in and get people focused on culture, he's bringing this back to the true point, saying that God's intent has never been for us to be divided by our cultures, but for us to be made into one new man. God's intent wasn't to say there's a, a group of Christians called Jews, there's a group of Christians called Gentiles, but he said that when Jesus came, he came to put us all together into one body. And, and remember earlier what we read last week, how Jesus is the head. He's seated with Christ, or, or Christ is seated with the Father in heavenly places, and we are his body here in the realm of the earth. And until he returns, we are the representatives of Christ on the earth. The best example Jesus could give to the people when he walked on the earth, he said this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Right? Now he ascends into heaven, and we are his body, who is all, filling all, 
And now we are responsible as citizens of heaven to say to one another and to say to our community and the citizens of the world, if you've seen us, you've seen the Father. Wow. I mean, you know, we have a long ways to go, but we're making progress. Let's thank the Lord that we are making progress. Amen. So we're in this, this time as he ascends into heaven that we are now his representatives on the earth and we're not to be talking about building two different groups but we're to be about building one new man. And let's just kind of walk, walk through this together. Verse 14, he himself is our peace. Let's, let's talk about that. Bring verse 14 back up for a moment. Thank you. He himself is our peace. If you've ever been the victim of any type of racism, discrimination, whatever it is, sometimes it might even have been done in the name of Jesus. But the word of God says that he is our peace. Now what somebody else did in his name, they're responsible for their actions. See, we will one day stand before God for everything we've said or done. But as, as pastor to all of you here today, I want to speak a word of hope that the way to find healing is through Jesus. He himself is our what? Peace. And so trying to find peace apart from Jesus, we can find some relief, but to find real healing, to find real restoration, to find real peace, I think... The word of God is very clear. He's our peace. And as, we, as I get older, I'll just speak for myself, I learn more things as I've gotten older. Things that I was so sure about when I was younger, I, I'm a little, little bit wiser now as I've walked down the road a few more years. Does anybody else feel that? And, and so along that way, Different things happen to different people. But I have found that the greatest way to find restoration and peace between cultures is that we come through Jesus. And that we ask for forgiveness, we extend forgiveness, we receive forgiveness. All of that is connected to genuine healing and genuine peace coming into our lives. And the most amazing thing is, is that you can reach a place on this journey that, you know, it, it's like if you get an injury, but that injury is getting better, eventually it gets healed. But until it's fully healed, you still know that injury was there. True? Maybe you cut yourself and, and there's a scab and you don't want to mess with that. But pretty soon that falls off and you forget about it. It, it may even leave a scar, but, but you don't think about it. It doesn't stop you from going on in your journey. You know what I'm saying? And, and there's things in our lives and there's things in our past that if, if we don't get the healing power of the blood of Jesus to reconcile it, it's like that wound never closes. It's like that wound never, it might have happened to you when you were six years old and now you're 66 years old. And it's like that wound never closes. But I tell you that no matter who you are, what you face, what you've gone through, that if the peace of Jesus heals that wound, there will be a day that you'll go on in your journey and you won't feel it. You won't remember it in that painful way. You'll be able to say, I remember I was hurting me. I remember it was painful, but I know today I have been healed. Amen. Jesus is our peace. See, he's the, he's the way to have peace. He abolished in his flesh, verse 15, he abolished in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that he himself might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Now the law of commandments, Paul writes in the book of Romans, the law is good. The law is not sinful, but sinful man can never fulfill the law. And sinful man can use the law to attack one another.
And so he didn't abolish the law like the law was sinful, that the law was wrong. But the law could never be fulfilled by any of us, especially with our fallen nature. But we have used the law to bring harm to one another. But he, in his flesh, broke the dividing wall. What are those things we use to hurt each other? What are those things? Well, I am right, and therefore I can hurt you. I am doing this in the name of good. And Jesus came in his flesh to die on a cross to break down that dividing wall so that we could get whole. It's a powerful thought. Those things that we use to divide us. The greatest commandment is love. They said to him, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In this, you will fulfill or keep the whole law. The law of love. Now, we're going to... Let's think about the law of love as we look at this word enmity. Because it says that he himself would make the two of us into one new man, establishing peace. Verse 16, might reconcile them both in one body. And so part of this getting peace is go through a process of reconciliation. You know, sometimes we say, well, I'll just forget it and I'll get better. I won't talk about it, I'll get better. I'll ignore it and I'll get better. But if you don't get the splinter out, it's always going to be sore. You know what I mean? And so he, he came to reconcile. He came to get the splinter out. And by it, having put to death the enmity. Now let's look at this word en enmity defined. Ekthros. It means hostility, hatred, and by implication, a reason for opposition. So let's, let's talk about that. By implication, a reason for opposition. People can justify their hatred. See, this word enmity is a justified hatred. Wow. That's a powerful thought, isn't it? That something happened when Jesus died on the cross that he put to death the power of enmity. That very word is a justified hatred a justified opposition that I am justified to stand against you. I am justified to hurt you. I'm justified to speak against you. And Jesus died on the cross to stop that from happening. He broke his power. It represents the feelings and actions which are the opposite of agape. See, when Jesus talks about love, Peter, do you love me? And he said, you know, I love you. Jesus uses one word. Peter uses another word. And we don't see that. We just see love. And so he asks him again. And Peter's a little bit embarrassed. He goes, I answered you. But there's a higher love, agape. And this is what 1 Corinthians talks about. Love does not take into account a record of wrong. Love believes all things. All these things that love will do. Love will hope all things. Love will believe all things. Love will never fail. Agape. And so this word enmity, it actually represents the opposite side of the coin of agape. It's just the opposite actions. And so when Jesus died on the cross to put to death the enmity, the only solution to enmity, hatred, opposition, justified hatred, is God's pure love. Wow. It represents the feelings and actions which are the opposite of agape, which is God's ability to love at a level man cannot achieve without him. So it doesn't mean that we cannot move into this type of love, but we need God to get us there. And that's why when somebody hurts us and we don't, get healed, we don't get restored, we don't receive peace, we tend to do the same thing to somebody else. 
And that's why some of the most evil things that we see happen, first it happens to us, and then we give it to someone else down the line. Jesus came to stop that chain reaction. Jesus came to break the power of that thing. Ephesians 2, 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and to preach peace to those who were near. See, Jesus preached the same message to everyone. Everyone has to respond equally to this message. We have to accept that he has provided a way that is different than we might have known before. If we say, but I was far away, and in my culture we did this, in my culture we did that. He isn't saying that your culture is wrong, your culture is bad, but he's saying that it was incomplete. God reaches beyond the cultures into the ethnoth. Jesus says, go into all the nations, go into all the world and preach this gospel to all the nations, to all the ethnos. And that is speaking into every single culture of mankind. So our cultures may be different, but Jesus is the one that that culture is looking for. Our cultures don't have to become alike for us to come to Jesus, but Jesus is the one that can bring peace and reconciliation into any culture. There is a higher calling. See, Jesus goes to the woman at the well, and the first thing she says to him, why are you a man from who is a Jew talking to me, a woman who is a Samaritan? She lists four different cultures. Men and women don't get along, Jews and Samaritans don't get along. These four different reasons why the two of us should not be speaking now. And Jesus just said, I just need you to help me get a drink of water. How many of you know we all need a drink of water? Isn't that a beautiful picture? See, go preach the gospel where? Judea, your hometown, those who are near, preach this to those who are near. Samaria, Jews and Samaritans didn't get along, did they? Well, they do now. They do now. And then where? To the outermost parts of the world, to the ethnos, to all the Gentiles. Isn't this a beautiful picture that, that God has always intended us all to come together in this way? If we want to experience and achieve true unity and peace, we must let go of the hostilities which have driven us in the past. When we embrace the blood of Christ through the cross, true forgiveness and healing is found in any person's life. Amen. Now leave that statement up there. I, I say that if we want to experience and achieve true unity and peace, we must let go of the hostilities which have driven us in the past. Can a person have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and still hold on to hostility. I've heard testimonies from some of you that have grown up in other parts of this nation in other decades. And even the things that we're experiencing now are major breakthroughs. I've heard it said that the most segregated hour of the week is the Sunday morning hour because people of different races and colors do not go to the same churches. We have to let go of hostility and bitterness. We have to let go. You can believe in Jesus for your sins to be forgiven and go to heaven when you die, but we're going to be in for a real rude awakening that everybody up there didn't look like you. <laughs> You're like, what are they doing here? They, don't, they didn't think like me. Aren't you glad we all don't think alike? You know, Peter Wagner gets in trouble. And those of you that know Dr. Wagner is a very dear friend to myself and Don. And he gets in trouble with Christians. Non-Christians seem to like the guy okay, but it's the, the Christians. That really... But Peter, Peter said, that as I've grown in understanding the scriptures and I've grown as a man, there's even things that today I disagree with things I wrote about in books that I wrote before. Now that takes a pretty secure guy to admit that, doesn't it? Well, that's one of the things I love about Peter. We have to let go of some things. 
Even at the time we were holding on to them, we thought we were right. We thought they were important, but you gotta, there's some things that are important to let go for healing to come into our lives. Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Woo, Who's ready to have access to Father? I mean, you're like if, if, you needed, if you needed surgery and there was like one top surgeon, wouldn't you be glad if you had access to that top surgeon? And I think all of us need our hearts. Our hearts need some surgery. Father is the great surgeon, okay? So through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Verse 19. It looks like I'm going to make it to the end, guys. Come on. That was pretty weak. Anyways, moving right along. Verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Wow. Isn't that great? We're no longer strangers. We're no longer far off. We're no longer aliens. We are citizens of heaven. We're citizens of a realm where there's life, where there's healing, where there's restoration. We're citizens. We are fellow heirs of God's household. Doesn't it make you sad whenever people in the same household can't get along? You know, we get all happy because it's Thanksgiving or Christmas, but how many of you know that that's some of the most painful time of the year? <laughs> and why is it painful? Because we're the same household. And people have chosen not to get along. It, it just goes on at every level. There's a, there's a realm that's so much higher. There's a realm that's so much better. Verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Oh, if you want your house to stand, let Jesus be the cornerstone of that house. If you want your house to have peace, make Jesus the cornerstone of your house. If you want to have the lasting peace of God that will sustain any storm, let Jesus be the cornerstone of that house. He's the chief cornerstone, verse 21, in, ho in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Wow. That God, God is building something with us right here on earth to let people see on earth what it's going to look like in heaven. Isn't that a beautiful picture? So I want to wrap it up with this about accessing the way to the highest culture. The true culture of the kingdom of God is greater than any earthly culture. Do you believe that? The way of the kingdom is the way of forgiveness and reconciliation. And all of this is provided to us through the cross of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for letting us look at the word of God together. Thank you, Lord, that we, we've read together from the Holy Scriptures a message of hope, a message of restoration, that it comes through Jesus. It comes through Jesus. Now, in a group this size and with so much diversity, I know that there have been things that have happened to people here that you've been judged, you've been criticized because of the color of your skin, because of the amount of money you might have or not have, because of the part of town that you grew up in, because of your last name. And the list could go on and on. 
even down to if you attend a charismatic church. Criticisms, judgments. And if you feel like those things have hurt you and just still part of what's going on inside of you, and you want God to bring real peace and, and real restoration, would you just lift your hand right now in this atmosphere and say, Father, I want to be healed. I want to be healed. I want to be healed. Hands are being raised throughout. throughout. Jesus. 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 I'm just feeling the love of the Father for all of you if you're raising your hands right now. I'm kind of speechless. I want to bring you up here and just hug you. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I just feel like if you take a step up here, there's going to be something that's going to happen for healing. If you're raising your hands, would you come up here just in this middle section and just come together side by side right there, right there on that brown carpet, okay? Just go ahead and step back just a little bit. Just, there you go, right there. Just come on up. Come on up. I want to invite everybody raising your hand. Just kind of, kind of get in here together. I'm not looking for a big long line. I'm just looking for us. Let's get in here together. We're going to bring the family together this morning. See, Father God loves his family. Father God loves his family. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. I mean, when things go right in the house at Thanksgiving or Christmas and everybody hugs, isn't that a good feeling? I just feel like something's going to happen here this morning. Just come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Now I want to ask others to just, just love. You just feel the love of God. Just come stand right behind them. Just put a, a hand of encouragement. You're not going to pray for them. You're not going to talk to them right now. Just come put a hand of encouragement saying, you are not alone. You're loved. You're part of the family. You're part of the body. Can we just come up here and love each other? Can we come up here together? I want a sister to come right up here. My sister Esther, she's kind of in the front. I want somebody to come right here. Just come right up here. Love you, Sister Esther. She's so special. For all my brothers and sisters, Jesus felt your pain on that cross when they mocked him, they scorned him, they made fun of him, they physically beat him, they spit on him. They ripped the beard out of his face. They beat him with the cat of nine tails. They all felt justified in their enmity against him. They thought what they were doing was good for community. They thought what they were doing was good for mankind. He took into his physical body what you've been feeling, what you've been sensing. And I want you right now to feel the love of Jesus wrapping around your arms, wrapping around your heart, wrapping around your life. Let him wrap around you. Let him love you. Let him restore you. And I want you to hear Father's words to you today. Father is saying, I never spoke those things about you. I never sent those people to do those things to you. The Father says, you're my son, you're my daughter, you are my children. And you are loved. And you are received. And he holds you. And he heals the scars of the heart. The scars. And the wounds. And he breaks the power of enmity 
in your life. Justified hatred is broken. It no longer has a hold on our life because of the blood of Jesus. Jesus. I'd like us to say a prayer out loud together today. If you pray this out loud, I'm just asking you to mean it. And I know in this atmosphere, you wouldn't do it if you didn't. But this is for all of you that are up here with me as well as everybody else that's joining. Could we say this prayer? Thank you, Jesus, that you found me when I was far away and you called me near. And I've heard your voice and I receive your love and I receive your forgiveness I receive your healing and I receive your peace today I release any person that has hurt me physically emotionally or spiritually I let go of them and I grab hold of you I'm part of your body I'm a citizen of heaven and I receive your healing into every area of my life my mind my soul my heart my emotions my physical family every part of me that's been hurt or wounded I receive peace into my life right here right now because you are my peace thank you Jesus let's give him praise everybody amen